Uh, we are in the second section. The first section is 10 key beliefs, uh, things that, that we believe as a follower of Christ. The second section is 10 key actions, things that we do as a follower of Christ. And then the, the following uh, 10 weeks will be 10 things that we are becoming as a follower of Christ. So today, uh, we are talking uh, about a biblical community. I want to pause before we, before we move into this. Um, not every church is always a biblical community, even a church that holds the Bible high. When we're talking about a biblical community here, we're talking a place where people can go and they can be loved and they can be cared for and a church, a, a community of folks who loves Christ and wants to participate and live uh, within that kind of bonds. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. But I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of times when I and you and others have stepped into a church and not experienced that kind of community. And that is a sad thing when that happens. And it has happened to all of us, my guess would be. And so today, uh, as we go through and as what we talk about, what does it mean to be a biblical community up here at Evergreen? I just want us to just allow the slate to be wiped clean if we've had bad experiences someplace or whether we've had a bad experience up here and allow Christ to do a new thing in our lives because um, God wants us to be a kind of biblical community that this world desperately, desperately needs. Uh, and so, by the way, this church does a great job at this. It really, really does. But there's always room for improvement. Now, before we go on, many, many years ago, a person at this church, uh, we were talking about how we can do this, how we can participate in other people's lives, came to me and said, Lance, I do not go to church to meet new people. I go to church to see my friends, to sing in the choir, and I go home. I'm going to say that again. He said, I do not go to church to meet new people. I go to church to see my friends, to sing in the choir, and go home. That is not biblical community. When we look at the scriptures today, you'll see that is the exact antithesis to biblical community. And when we live that way here, and someone new comes in our doors, and they experience that, they'll say, why would I ever want to be a part of that? And so I want us to think very clearly about biblical community today, because this is so important. Because if we become known in this community as a place that is not a biblical community, that is almost impossible to change. So let's pray. Father, there is no such thing as a perfect church on this earth. And that is because churches are filled with people like us. And we're not, we're not perfect. We don't even claim to be perfect. We, we know that we make mistakes. We know at times we're not the church that we could be or that we should be. We know the times that there are times when we don't want to see new people. We don't want to participate in other people's lives. We don't want them to participate in our, eyes, in our lives. But Lord, you created us for community. And we need it. And so do the people who are around us. And so speak to us gently if we need to be spoken to gently. Club us over the head if we need to be clubbed over the head. But get our attention because Scripture calls us to be a biblical community. So speak to us now, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to start out with our, our key question from the, from the book, and that is, how do I develop healthy relationships with others? I'm going to go through this first part real quickly. The key idea is, I fellowship with Christians to accomplish God's purposes in my life, in the lives of others, and in the world. I want us to look at this. There's three things there. We are part of a biblical community to do two things. One is so that God can do his purposes in my life. 
but it doesn't stop there. When we are a biblical community, God uses us in the lives of other people. And so it's not just about us, but it's about others as well. And then, of course, there is um, in the world as well. The key text today is taken from Acts chapter 2. And this is the, from 44 to 47. It says, All believers were together and had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want us to think back to something that you have heard about but probably have never seen. And you know what it is? It is a barn raising. Uh, now, we don't live in a place where they raise barns. Uh, but if we lived here probably back in the late 1800s, they would have. Um, but they still do barn raisings in certain places of the country, uh, typically within a couple of different uh, church cultures. But if you were back in the day, that is what you would have seen. Uh, now notice there are the ladies that are there, uh, there are the men that are there, and, and literally, we're going to talk about it in a moment real quickly, but, but the community would come together to do something that a family or an individual couldn't do. So the ladies came together and they cooked, and boy, let me tell you, they had all kinds of good food, and the guys would get there and they would work, 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 and they could do amazing things. Well, just to show you that it didn't happen back then, here's a picture of a more recent one where they're actually using uh, what I would call laminated trusses or something to that effect. Uh, makes it a little bit easier, uh, but you've got the crazy people up high. I'd be one of the people down low because I don't like heights, and I've got the ballast to be down low to be the one pushing stuff up there. And that's a little bit of a picture of one that is more recently. Uh, here's one that is um, a great picture of a more recent one. And you just look at all those guys and you wonder how in the world do they not hit each other with two by fours and braces and all of that sort of stuff. But let me tell you, they know how to do it and they put together a barn faster than you could imagine. This next one, I think, took more than one day uh, because if you take a look, there is a cement block wall on the lower portion of the part that is down below. You'd have to see it up close. And I don't believe that they could put the weight of the structure up above uh, on those cement blocks until af after the cement had, um, or the, the, the ground in between them had, um, had cured. But that's a picture of a community, a biblical community working together. So typically in a barn raising, the community comes together, they address the needs of a, t of a particular family or person, Oftentimes they donate time, well they donate time, but sometimes they even donate materials. This still happens today, but typically it's in the Amish or the Mennonite communities. And here's the deal, everyone benefits, not just the person or the family that gets the barn. Because eventually your barn is gonna fall down. Your barn is gonna get struck by lightning. Your barn is gonna get flooded. And so it, it, it helps everybody. So that is what a barn raising is, raising is, it's where everybody works together. That's one example of how a church can be a community. Well, I want to take a look at one of the commandments in Exodus chapter 20. God told Moses to write this down. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, an image or idol, in the form of anything, in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now you're probably wondering, why in the world is he talking about idols when we're talking about biblical community today? And that is because in this country, we have an idol, and that idol is called independence. I am independent from everybody or everything else. I choose to be independent. Now, let's just, let's just take a look at this whole idea of independence. The idea of independence really crept in as sin in Genesis chapter 3. Satan told Adam and Eve, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened 
and you will what? You will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Independence. They no longer would have to be dependent on God. Why? Because they would be like God. And we have had the idol of independence ever since then. By the way, we as a country um, have a declaration of independence. Now, let me make sure you understand this. I am not against our country. I'm not against our declaration of independence. I, there's not another country in this world I'd rather live in. Okay? Let's just get that right up front. Here's what the Declaration of Independence says. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, okay, I agree with that, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, what are those rights? Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How many of those three things are biblical? The answer is none. There is nothing up there in those three that is biblical. You and I do not have the right of life. If God wants to take our life, he can do that. And there would be a grease spot right here where Lance was standing. God took people's lives who did what they were not supposed to do. If you touched the Ark of the Covenant when you were not supposed to, you died. Out in the desert, there were people who did some things while they were out in Sinai that they were not supposed to do. God basically warned people, move away from those families because they're going to get swallowed up by the earth. And God opened up the earth and those families went in. We do not have the right to live. It's nice when we live, but that is not a right. The second one that was there is liberty. I'm sorry. Scripture says that we are either a slave to Satan or we are a slave to God. The term is bond servant. We have been set free from sin, but we choose to be a servant to Jesus Christ. When we say Lord, that means he has ownership. So I do not have liberty. What I do is I have a gracious Lord who is over me. So we do not have uh, liberty and happiness. Take a look at God's people in an awful lot of scripture. Now there is joy. That's different than happiness. But there's a lot of times when things are not necessarily happy. Independence does not lead us to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, we have an Independence Day. I love it. Uh, Alyssa and Mark don't because their dog hates the fireworks. Uh, we were up at their house for the Super Bowl, and there must have been some Denver Bronco fans in the neighborhood because they set off fireworks, and the dog heard them before we did, and she immediately got very, very nervous. Um, uh, but Independence Day, I love the fireworks. Uh, we can open our front curtain and our back curtain, and you can kind of look between the two, and you can watch fireworks going off. It's pretty cool. But independence is I can do what I want and when I want, and you do your own thing. That, I'm sorry, is the opposite of a biblical community, especially as one that we see in the New Testament. See, the idol of independence leads us from independence from God, and it then leads us to or through or from independence from others, and that would be God's people. It is hard to be a biblical community when we do not have connections and close connections with God's people. So how do we go about being a biblical community? I've got three things that I just want us to look at, and you all know me, I don't normally do three-point sermons, so please mark this down on the calendar. Um, you probably aren't going to hear another three-point sermon for probably another five years. Uh, anyhow, the first thing is be united. Now, what do we mean by be united? 
Be united is this, is we keep the main thing the main thing. When you find a church that is not united, you'll know it because there's a whole lot of different main things. Every group, everything is going in a different direction. And that is um, not a biblical community. By the way, have you ever wondered what the main thing is? Jesus is the main thing, okay? I knew you'd all get that, so if there's ever a Jeopardy question, what is the main thing? Um, pardon me, the answer is Jesus. You just say, you know, question is, what is, who is the main thing? First and foremost, if we're not centered around Christ as a, as a worshiping body and as small groups, then we are not keeping the main thing the main thing. And so that is first and foremost uh, in terms of being united. The second thing, as we're going to take a look at what does it mean to be united, in Acts chapter 2, for, uh, verse 44, which is what we look at today, it said two things uh, I just want to look at in this next thing, and that is they were together and they had things in common. That means that they participate in each other's lives, and this just wasn't on Sunday. If you, if you remember the text, uh, what did it say that they did every day? They met in the temple courts. It said that they broke bread and they ate together. Uh, and so what, the, what a biblical community is, is they are together more often than just a worship service. Um, and then they have things in common. It said that they sold their possessions and their property and then they gave that money so that those who were in need could have the needs met. And so a biblical community meets together and they have things in common. Okay, the third thing is, uh, if you were to take a look at Philippians chapter two, uh, verses one through five, we would see a number of things that are also there. And since you all have it memorized, Tell you what, let's just look at it. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking after your own interests, uh, but each of you to the interests of others. So if we live out Philippians chapter 2 uh, in relationship to that Acts chapter 2 portion, that is the picture of being a biblical community. And then the next part of that would be uh, in Romans 12, which Brenda read earlier, I just don't pick stuff out of the, out of the air just because it sounds good. I love, I mean, Romans chapter 12, but it says we belong to each other. Guess what? Whether you like it or not, I belong to you, and you belong to me. Now, why do I belong to you, and why do you belong to me? It is so that each of us can grow and mature in our walk with Christ, we, I need you and you need me in order for that to happen. In the, in the teaching in our small groups we saw in the video, Randy Frazee talked about the number of times people can quit smoking by themselves. Statistically, it's zero. They need other people to be along and to help them. I think we could say the same thing for any kind of addiction. So it would be, we need each other. So whether you like it or not, you need me. And whether I like it or not, I need you. By the way, I like it an awful lot. Because um, we belong to each other. You have gifts and talents that nobody else has. That, that this church needs. That this body needs. And so we need each other. So that's the first thing, be united. The second part of being a biblical community is to be active. Um, Notice what it said in the Acts passage. It said that they sold things, they broke bread, and they ate together, and they met together. They did things together. That is important. When we do things, it changes us. Counselors, marriage counselors have said, and I've read this a number of times, that if there's a couple who is having some marriage problems, here's what you do. You cannot complain about your spouse for a month 
And every day, you have to find something that you can compliment them about. Every day. And you have to tell it to them, to their face. Did you know that almost without fail, at the end of 30 days, their marriage is stronger? That, that they are... Um, closer together and they're communicating and their feelings towards each other have changed because they are doing something proactive every day and they're doing it intentionally. And so when we are being active together, it really, really does do things. It brings us together as a community and it also helps us to grow. Part of our being active, if we take a look at Galatians chapter 6, I'm not going to have the whole text up there, but it says that we are supposed to bear one another's burdens. How do we do that? Well, we can't do it if we don't know that somebody has something that's going on in their life that, that they need help with. And, and it may just be just sitting with someone who's, who's sad or, or who's depressed or is grieving or something, but we need to come alongside one another, and we don't know that someone even needs someone to come alongside them if we're not near them and if we're not talking to them and we're not a part of a community with them. And so, so we need to find ways that we can bear one another's burdens. We find that stuff out when we are a biblical community. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says that we are supposed to be one another's cheerleaders. Please don't picture me as a cheerleader. That is a sick, horrible picture. But I am your cheerleader, and you are my cheerleader. And we need to be cheering each other on and encouraging people. That works a heck of a lot better than saying, man, you screwed up again. How many times do I have to talk to you about screwing up? It sure works a lot better if when we see someone do something really good, we say, man, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for doing that. And cheer people on. And that's what Hebrews said, says, is that we're supposed to spur one another on. And by the way, it's also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we are to encourage one another. So we need to be active in each other's lives. Let's face it, there's times you don't want other people to be in your life. I totally understand that. There's times when I don't want people to be in my life either. But there's times when we really need it, when we really need it, because we're created to need it, because we need each other. We're created that way in God's eyes. Okay? Third thing, we need protection. Satan has the best chance at getting at you and me when we are isolated from other believers. I have blind spots in me, and you have blind spots in you. There are times when there may be something that you don't see, but somebody else does. When, when Brenda and I were at Moses Lake, it was, a, it was the, the second best church I've ever been at in terms of being a pastor. This is by far and away the best. I'm not saying that just because I love you all, and I'm here now. They, but they were a good church. And it was after church one day, and that was a church where everybody, whether they liked to, wanted to, or otherwise, had to walk by and shake the pastor's hand. And it just wasn't the pastor. It was the associate pastor, and it was also their lay leader. So there was this long line after church, and everybody had to walk by and had to shake the pastor's hand. Believe it or not, there were people who really didn't want to do it, there were a couple people who would sneak out the back door, but if the people at the sound booth saw them heading for the back door, they wouldn't let them go out the back door. So anyhow, uh, one day after church, these two little old ladies, about this tall, waited till the very end of the line, which was not usual for them. And um, they came up to me. Pastor Lance, we need to talk with you. Okay. And then they said, there's this lady who has been a part of our congregation, and she's been in a mental hospital for the last several years, and she was just released this week. You need to be on your guard. You need to be cautious around her. I have no idea. I had no idea who she was. Never even heard her. Or had no idea what her name was or anything like that. It wasn't... What, Brenda? Two, three, four weeks at the most. And our phone would start ringing at home at night. 
it got to where I didn't answer the phone because it was that lady. We talked with personnel committee at church. Uh, I was never available, ever, uh, if she were to call. And fortunately, uh, they didn't have the pastors answer the phone. We had a full-time secretary. She answered the phone. And, and the personnel committee said, you are never available for her. They, they told Garrett, our senior pastor, if she needs to be a pastor at that point in time, you drop what you're doing so that Lance doesn't do it. Garrett was right at retirement age. So I don't want to make any comments there, but, but those little ladies, I'll forever be thankful. That is a biblical community. They knew someone that I didn't know who was going to start coming back to our church. And there must have been something like this that happened in the past. And they were there for me. Just like you are there for each other and that you are there for me and I am there for you. We need protection because Satan wants to do anything and everything he can do to keep you from growing, to tear you down, and to ruin the ministry and mission that you have and also that our church has. We need one another for protection. If you take a a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 2 through 12, um, I use this in weddings, but it's not just supposed to be for weddings. It says, two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. That's saying that you and I, when woven together as a biblical community, we have strength and we have protection. And it's amazing what we can withstand. Now, I had all of this done before yesterday, and we got home uh, after going out to a movie with the kids. And um, I was sitting there, and I was looking at some uh, YouTube videos for an upcoming class I'm going to be teaching on boating. And there was a tsunami that hit Santa Cruz uh, back in, I think it was 2011. And people uh, were—it's amazing how many different perspectives that people had filmed this. But there was—I mean, docks were just destroyed— And there was this one boat that had to have been 40 feet long. The dock that it had been tied to was destroyed. But the bow line had been tied to a piling. And that boat got whipped every which way you can imagine. And they never showed that boat being destroyed. They never showed that bow line breaking. That is the strength of you and I bonded together and that third strand is Christ in our midst. And he is the one who gives us that ultimate protection. So what we have is others protect us and we protect others. Now when I talk about Satan, he has the same strategy that a pack of wolves have. When a pack of wolves come, they try to separate one animal They don't go after the whole pack, I mean the whole herd, they go after one. Um, Many, many years ago when Brenda's dad and I were in the back country of Alaska helping build a cabin, at about one in the morning, a a herd of, I mean, a a pack of wolves chased down a cow moose and killed it about 100 yards from our camp. She she didn't have a chance. I mean, they, they, they killed her right there. And then they couldn't eat her because we were so close. And we ran out, I think, you know, trying to see this moose. Uh, we found her body the next day. And the wolves, for the next two days, sat up on the hillside watching for us to leave so they could go down and eat her. That is what Satan wants to do with you and me when we are alone. We do not have a group to protect us. That is the strategy of Satan. It's the strategy of wolves. However... There is another strategy that I really like, and it is the strategy of the muskox. What the muskox do is they form a tight formation. 
They put the vulnerable ones in the back if the danger is out that way. And they say, try. I dare you, try. That is what us as a Christian biblical community are supposed to be. And here is our picture. That should be every church that is a biblical community. Standing shoulder to shoulder, side by side, if you could see that in full color, really blown up, you'll see that there are actually some smaller ones in between those two or three big ones in the front. And they're heading after the perceived threat that is in front of them. And they're not going to surrender to the enemy. That is biblical community. That is us standing in the face of of Satan in the world, and that's us charging into this world to take the good news of Jesus to the people who desperately need it. Let's pray that we would be a biblical community. Father, it's not easy to be a biblical community. It's a heck of a lot easier for us just to sit at home, do what we want, because it, it takes effort. It, there's hurt as well as love. Uh, there's excitement and there's frustration in working with any group of people. But we're not just a group of people. We're your kids. And you have told us that we're to be a biblical community, whether we like it or not. You've told us that we belong to each other. You have purposely gifted us with different gifts because we need all of those gifts and we need each other. You have given us each other as protection. And we need protection, but we also need to help protect one another. Father, thank you that Evergreen does a pretty darn good job of being a biblical community. But there's always more that we can do. And so, Lord, this week, as we think about and as we pray about and as we memorize the, the biblical verse uh, about us being a biblical community, Lord, just remind us to be united, to keep you first, to participate in each other's lives by meeting regularly and often, doing things together and for each other, and being there being there for one another. Thank you for the call and the opportunity to be your biblical community. Father, if there's anybody here who has been hurt by a church or by people who go to a church uh, and they did not experience biblical community, Lord, I pray that you would be with them and that you would heal those wounds that they would be open at some point uh, to experiencing community in a way that this world just can't understand. Father, if there's anybody here that, uh, that doesn't know your son Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord, this is going to sound kind of weird to them as we talk about a biblical community, but Lord, um, I just pray that you'd be with them and that uh, you would not let them be alone and that we would have the opportunity to walk alongside them because it's not safe for them to be alone. And uh, they need us just as we need them. And so, Lord, uh, for those that don't know you, uh, Lord, I would just pray that we could become a part of their community and that they become a part of ours. Lord, we're not perfect at this, so help us every day uh, to live into your call for us to be a biblical community. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.